Welcome to Reaching Reverie. Today is the week 13 garden tour. We have a lot to harvest, so come on, let's go. So I normally shoot and record my garden tours on Sunday mornings, but today it's actually June 27th, which is Saturday in the evening. Um, and I'm gonna record it today because we're expecting some heavy rainfall tonight. And the worst thing you can do is harvest your vegetables after a heavy rain. Did you know that heavy rain can actually dilute the flavor of things like tomatoes? So we're gonna get them tonight. It's been nice and warm and hot all day long and it just dropped about 20 degrees and I can hear the thunder. The rain is coming. So we're gonna harvest all of these fruit before the rain. That way we can get them when they're still packed full of wonderful flavor. All right guys, now let's see if you can notice what's missing in my garden. Some of you might know right away. Have you guessed it? What? Where's all the corn? Where's my zucchini? So last week I had some dwarf bronze corn in this section and I also had two zucchini plants right here. I had a couple marigolds as well that I pulled out and I pulled these out right after I ended the garden tour last week, the week 12 garden tour. I think next year I'm gonna to try to hand pollinate and I'm also gonna grow in a bigger space. So we went ahead and got rid of that at that point where we are halfway through the growing season. So if there is a time to start a new round of fruits, it's right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and have some new plants started in this garden bed that way we can get a second harvest and a second growing season within our growing season this year. Lots of opportunity to learn how to grow new things. And you can see, I actually sowed these, this whole half of a bed um, last Sunday. So it has been six days now and I already have some germination in these areas. I have some zinnias that I planted in a row right here and that's gonna replace marigolds that I had right here. So with the marigolds that I pulled out right here, I just deadheaded all the flowers, took the seeds off of the flowers and just scattered them around my whole yard. I noticed that the chickens aren't touching my marigolds, so I thought that would add some color in the yard if they do grow anywhere. I sprinkled some around the trees um, and I know the chickens are gonna leave them alone. So it really was stressing this marigold out sitting next to a corn, which takes a lot of nutrients to grow. In the center here, I replanted zucchini because I love zucchini and it, it was so disappointing that my two plants early on didn't produce anything. So before I even sowed any seeds, I went ahead and amended the soil. I actually removed all of the um, straw that I have as mulch and I amended the soil, added some um, calcium in the form of eggshells and crushed up tums and then I went ahead and re-mulched with this. Um, this is the type of, it's called Bermuda straw and it's like a grass that's dried into a hay and we actually use this um, to put in our nesting boxes for the chickens to lay their eggs on. So it's something that we have plenty of. It cost I think $13 where we live for a big like 50 pound bale. So we always have plenty of it on our little homestead and I actually mulch with this because it breaks down faster than mulch so it helps keep your soil moist but as this breaks down it's going to provide um, little micronutrients back into the soil which is really healthy for your plants. So I have my green zucchini that I planted right here. I also did two varieties of radishes. I have an icicle radish over here which is actually germinating really nicely. Radishes are a very quick returning reward of a crop to grow. Um, they do prefer cool weather, cold weather. This is not the season to grow them, but I have a lot of radishes that have been volunteering in my garden beds all season that I just, I'm confident that they'll do pretty good. This is a pretty high shade area of the garden. So I think that they're gonna do just fine. And on the other side, I did some other variety of radish. There's a couple popping up. I don't know, I'll have to look at the seed packet. It was a round red one 
with a white on the bottom. I think it was like a giant sparkler or something. It was a round radish. And then these are going to be long, skinny white radishes. You can see some of them coming up. And then on the edge over here, I went ahead and put up poles and these were the poles that were supporting my corn and I'm going to put string all along here zigzagging up and this is going to support what I planted in the corner over here that's a leaf I have some pole beans I went ahead and per planted some purple potted pole beans here and I also planted lemon cucumber and I'm really excited because I've never had lemon cucumber before so as y'all know, I do have purple potted pole beans planted in my front garden in the dog yard, but it's been a complete failure. I haven't had a single bean over there because I think they're in so much direct sunlight. With as much heat as we get out here, the flowers fall off before I can get any beans. So I'm expecting that since this area is going to be much more shaded, I think I might be able to get some beans this year. My cucamelon is doing really good, getting to the top of this stump. Now I'm not sure if I'm going to have any more cucamelons to eat this year though because I'm noticing that my garden is always full of birds. And I know for a fact that my cucamelons on the back wall over there, they were full of developing melons and now I just see a bunch of bird poop on that area and no melons. So I'm thinking that the birds are loving these. These just like wild sparrows and doves are eating all of my little fruits. <laughs> and they are delicious. They're just like miniature cucumbers. So I'm hoping that planting the lemon cucumber right here will give me some cucumbers. Do you hear that? <laughs> we get a train all the time here and you just learn to ignore it. I, I sometimes don't even hear it anymore. I bet y'all heard it though. <laughs> All right, so I think that the train might be far enough away. Let's get on with this garden tour. Come on. So my ground cherries, they don't look great. If you would have seen these probably two weeks ago, oh wait, y'all can, y'all can go back and see them because I have video of it. Um, if y'all look back two weeks ago, my ground cherries were really tall and vibrant and very sturdy. And with as much heat and sun as we've been getting, they've just kind of decided to crawl along the floor instead. And it has been a really hot day and I haven't watered my garden yet because I'm expecting some heavy rain here in a couple of hours. So the leaves are still nice. Um, we do have some bug damage, but they're not wilted or droopy really. But the stalks, like they're not upwards anymore. They're all just kind of leaning over. And so I'm just going to kind of see how it goes and monitor this plant. It does make me kind of sad that he's not enjoying how hot it is out here. I thought ground cherries would be a lot more like tomatillos because they're really related to tomatillos. I thought they were gonna do better in the heat. Let's see if we have any ground cherries in here. I see one, two, three. Let me know if I miss any, guys. One of the people that I work with was also growing ground cherries and hers, she said they didn't get very far before they died. I think she started some seeds. So I went ahead and took her a couple of ground cherries that I picked this morning so that she could try them so that it will help motivate her to try again next year because there's always next year if something doesn't grow or if something dies early on in the garden. Look, there's another one right there. Now, it's going to be really tempting when you see some ground cherries on your stalks and they look ready. They have the husker changing colors. They look like they're going to fall off any moment. Well, don't pick them. They're called ground cherries because the fruit is ripe when it falls to the ground. So if you pick them any earlier, you're likely going to get something that's not quite ready to eat yet. Now, these ground chairs are really good and they don't always make it back into the house. So the ground cherries, they're actually full of seeds. They're really seedy, but it kind of has the texture of like a grape and they're really good. It's not a flavor that I can really recognize or describe. 
It's unlike anything I've ever tasted before. Now, if I had to put a label on the flavor, I would say it's tart. It is sweet, has a slight tomato flavor to it. However, it is very fruity and I would even consider it similar to grapes kind of. So I would call it like literally a grape tomato. Now I need to stop eating my ground cherries so I can have something to bring into the house today. Let's see what else we have. My squash, it looks a little more bare than you've probably seen it. I took my pruners and I got in there yesterday and clipped quite a bit away from these plants. I took off any leaves that looked like they were dead or dying. I also took out one of my acorn squash plants and the one that I did leave in the ground, I pruned really far back just to the leaves that are still really thriving and healthy. So right back here on one of the butternut squash plants, there was a small butternut squash fruit that had started to develop. I even had it bagged in a little pantyhose just like this one to help alleviate the pressure and the weight of a squash growing on the vine so that it would, you know, not hurt the plant trying to grow because I am growing up on a trellis. In the wild, a plant like this would grow and sprawl all the way across the ground. Now that actually keeps moisture on the plant and causes disease and it'll make your plant die sooner in the season. So you won't get as much production and growth on those plants. So I'm growing them up on a trellis and you have to support the weight of the fruit so that the stem doesn't break. Now, the one that was over here, it ended up dropping the fruit before the fruit had developed fully. And instead of wasting that, we even thought about giving it to the chickens. I decided, you know, I know that butternut squash is a winter squash, but I bet you it would still be a pretty good, you know, already. This fruit was probably this big when it fell off the vine and butternut squash, they can get over a foot long. So it was kind of sad that we lost it so early, but when you do harvest these squash, when they're so young like this, the skin is still really thin and soft, kind of like a zucchini. So that's exactly how we prepared it. I sliced it up, um, I sauteed it with some white rice, tomatoes fresh from the garden, some fresh okra from the garden, jalapenos from the garden, and then I added a little bit of corn, some mozzarella, and lime juice. And it was absolutely amazing, like a little rice vegetable casserole, basically. So good. So. Butternut squash is what you would call a winter squash. And winter squash is a squash that you, you don't grow it in the winter. You start at the same time as you do a summer squash, but you let it mature all season until the skin of this fruit gets thick and hardens. And that way your squash can store better and therefore you can eat it all season and all winter long. Summer squash is when you harvest a squash during the summer growing season to eat during that season. So your squash, the, the Skin is edible um, and so we just ate the, our butternut squash as a summer squash. I really hope that this squash will hang in there and grow to his full potential and we can eat him as a butternut squash. I have noticed that just since yesterday in pruning this plant really heavily it already looks so much happier and healthier. The foliage that I did decide to leave on here is really thriving and it's gonna put off a lot of new growth because it's not putting energy into leaves that are already dying, essentially. Now let's look at these bell peppers. They are not huge yet, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and harvest a couple. Look at that, it's pretty albino bell pepper. And there's another one. Now these are quite small, but they're going to be absolutely delicious. Oh, look at that. This one's already starting to ripen. You can see he's turning purple. Now albino bell peppers, you can eat them when they're white or if you leave them on the plant long enough, they will ripen to red. And he's starting to do that. <clears throat> I'm gonna come over here and get that last one in the corner down there if I can reach it. This 
one's so tiny. Now I could have left these peppers on just a little bit longer and they would have gotten bigger. However, my plants are kind of small and extra weight causes extra pressure on the plants. Also, if I were to cut these fruit off, which I did, I'm letting that plant put more energy into more fruit growth, more flower development, more plant development, and that way you're gonna have a longer harvest throughout the season. I almost missed a couple. Look at this big boy right here. That is a really good one. Look at him. Does have a little spot. I'm glad I picked him now. And there's one hiding back here too. Oh, he's long. Looks like a banana. Look at how long that fella is. Now these are amazing. I did already harvest one a few weeks ago. And it tastes just like a bell pepper, maybe just slightly softer flavor. And I cut him up, sauteed him with some eggs that I found right from our farm. <laughs> and I actually also sliced up one of my Blue Beauty beefsteak tomatoes and threw some garlic, threw some onion in there, and I had amazing scrambled eggs with bell pepper and tomato fresh from our home. You can see my nasturtiums this week are flowering again and that makes me really happy because these plants in this garden bed had been struggling just a little bit with how hot and dry we've been the past few weeks. Now anytime I see a, a leaf that looks like it's sun damaged or scorched, I just, I go ahead and get rid of it and I feed it to the chickens. The chickens love it. Now let's take a look at all of these tomatoes. I've probably harvested four or five of these this week already, and I've been eating on them, and they are the best. And I'm not even saying this because I grew them. No kidding, these are the best tomatoes I've ever had. This is the Blue Beauty beefsteak tomato variety. And that blue color, that it looks kind of purplish, dark color, it's normal for this variety of tomatoes. So you can see on these tomatoes, they're already turning purple where the sunlight hits them. There's a little tiny one right here that's already purple. And that purple color is packed with antioxidants. Those are anthocyanins. Now this makes me sad. I can already see the sunlight was hitting it here and this plant's facing this way and I know the sunlight doesn't come from this direction. So let's follow up this branch and see the damage. We split right here and you know what? That is my fault. I'd been looking at these tomato plants all week telling myself I need to manage <laughs> their growth. So every couple of weeks I go and I tie the tomatoes to the trellis to keep the support on there as they grow and I didn't get to this one in time so that makes me really sad. I am going to go ahead and try to tie this one anyway and see if he can heal from this but it might be that I will end up having to harvest these tomatoes early and just have some fried green tomatoes with those that are on the stalks that are broken. This was one of the main stalks on this tomato plant, but I didn't get to all the suckers in time. So this tomato plant actually has a couple of different main stalks. There's another casualty right there. Look at how many tomatoes are back there. Oh my word. So yeah, I need to get in there and tie up my tomato plants. Like this one, I can tie right here. And then that way as this grows, it won't just snap in half like, like this one did. Gotta tie your tomato plants. I do have a lot of tomatoes that are ripening this week. I'm actually going to go ahead and harvest all of these. Look, you just see color of red everywhere. It's crazy because these tomato plants, they've had fruit on them for so long now and it's taking weeks and weeks for the tomatoes to turn red and then it's like all of a sudden they're starting to turn red. It is very exciting. Let me go ahead and grab 
these red ones. Not just beautiful. So look there, got six tomatoes today and I've already harvested a few more throughout the week so we probably got about 10 of these tomatoes this week. And you can see with so many more tomatoes growing on these plants, I hope we can harvest tomatoes all season long. And my tomatoes are still flowering which means that these are gonna be even more tomatoes. Now, these are what we call indeterminate tomatoes. An indeterminate tomato is a tomato that's just gonna to continue to grow until something kills it, like a frost. So these should grow, as long as they can stay healthy and without disease, they should grow until either a frost kills them or you know something takes them out, like a storm or weather. Now, look at this. You see it? <laughs> That's a praying mantis. And I love seeing these guys in the garden because they will eat things that are not good for your garden. They'll eat all the bad bugs. They are predators, great for the garden. And that is one of the bonuses of not using pesticides or chemicals in your garden is you can get that natural, you know, pest control growing in your garden. Your garden will create an ecosystem of its own if you just allow it to do so. Now let's take a look back deep down into my eggplant bush. What do y'all think? I think that eggplant looks about ready to harvest. I'm gonna go ahead and grab it. There it is. He's kind of pokey. He's got like these really sharp spines. Look, I already got one in my finger. So you gotta be careful when grabbing these. And I can actually feel, look at that. He's ready. Now, eggplant, and I've said this in a previous video, eggplant is ready to harvest from the moment that it starts growing basically until it's ripe. And then once it's ripe, if you go too much past that, the flavor can become bitter and it's you know, a lot more pithy and less edible. Isn't that pretty? This is Listata de Gandia. He does have some scars on him, but he's gonna eat up really nice. So I know that he's ripe because the bottom half of him right here is really squishy. And when you stick your thumb into him, he should leave a slight indentation. So I actually have a really funny story to tell you about my eggplant. So my mother-in-law came to town a couple weeks ago when I harvested my first eggplant from the plant. And she had never had eggplant before. So I thought, perfect. I sliced it, I fried it up, battered it. It was amazing and she absolutely loved it. So the next day before I went into work, she asked me, how did you make that eggplant? So I told her what I did, how I fried it, how I battered it. And when I came home from work, she surprised me with eggplant parmesan. Now she had gone to the store and bought that ginormous, dark purple, almost black colored eggplant. I forget the variety, but it's the one you get just from the grocery store. And we all sat down very excited because we had loved the eggplant we had had just a couple nights before. And we tried it and all of us, everybody was just like, mmm, this is great. And it was not, it was absolutely terrible. Now what it was, was the eggplant was so bitter. 
And what we think is one, it was store-bought, but two, I think it was overripe and the variety is just was just a generic eggplant variety. What makes Listata de Gandia so special is that it has a thin, soft, succulent skin that is made to not be bitter. So a lot of eggplant varieties, you're actually supposed to peel the skin off and um, cut that out of there because it's just gonna be bitter and it's gonna tarnish the flavor of the dish that you're preparing with just bitter eggplant flavor. So we didn't peel it because I didn't peel this one and that was a lesson learned. So from now on, we're just gonna stick to Listata de Gandia. It's an amazing, amazing variety of eggplant. If you can get past the fact that the bugs are gonna love it too. I mean, this plant is always covered in flea beetles, but I mean, that's just part of gardening. And so we are going to try to tackle the flea beetles a little bit sooner next year. Um, maybe start this a little bit later in the season so that it doesn't have to deal with as many pests early from spring and summer. But this is gonna be a keeper in the garden. This variety doesn't get very big. So if you're going for a huge eggplant, not going to happen. This one gets about six to eight inches, but it's worth it because I'm I'm a lazy cook. I love to cook, but I'm a lazy cook, and I don't want to sit there and peel my eggplants before I eat them. Plus, I feel like a lot of the nutrition is in the skin, so it's a good one to grow. Remember that. Now, you can see my plants over here. Look at that. It doesn't take any time at all to see that something is eating on my eggplant. And that is flea beetles. I guarantee if I just spend 20 seconds looking at these plants, I will see flea beetles and it's just gonna drive me crazy. So you can get past the flea beetles. This is the best eggplant to grow. So the rest of my garden over here is doing pretty good. I have a little zinnia that looks like it's about to bloom. This watermelon plant is just taking over. Like it goes all the way up the wall. And we even have a small watermelon right there. Cucamelons have taken over the back wall over here as well. I really need to remember to come back and tie this up when I'm done because I want you to live, little tomato. Let's go see what else we can harvest. Hey, Sunisa. You can smell the rain coming? It's a coming. Hey, what you doing, Ariel? Let's go see if we have any eggs. We can also say hi to Molly, our broody hen. So this is Molly. She's broody right now. So if y'all guys don't know what broody is, it means that she's a chicken that wants to have babies. So she is sitting on eggs so that hopefully those eggs will hatch. Now the thing is we don't have a rooster and you need a rooster to fertilize eggs. So these eggs are never going to hatch. So what I've been doing is anytime I find her in here, I take her out because we don't want her to be broody. It's a hormonal thing. She's gonna go through it. All the chickens will go through it probably at some point, but I'm gonna go ahead and get her out. So when hens are broody, you can see she ran right over to the water. She won't do anything but sit on the eggs. She might only come off the nest once a day to eat and drink and poop. The rest of the day she will sit on eggs. And since we know that she's not going to hatch any of these eggs, we're trying to take her off of the nest because every time we do she goes and she takes care of herself and eats and drinks. So we're going to try to keep her healthy and we're trying to break her broodiness just by removing her all the time. That way she'll snap out of it a little quicker. Broody hens can stay broody for a month and we don't want her to be broody for a whole month in the hottest time of the year because she's just gonna sit in this coop 
and it's too hot for that. So every time we see her, we just take her out, say, snap out of it, Molly, and we go from there. Got some pretty eggs today. Oh, gosh darn it. Had a pretty egg today. It happens. Well, poop. This is going into the garden. That's the first time I've ever done that. Can't believe I caught that on video. Now, I don't just give this to the chickens because I don't want them to learn to eat their eggs. So I will put it in the garden, mix it into the soil. That way my plants can have nutrition from this egg. I will take care of that later. That's a bummer. But nothing goes to waste here. Absolutely nothing goes to waste. Okay, so where I went wrong was I tried to set my egg in my little trug, which has really big holes, and it just slid out. Now, we actually count how many eggs we have each day, and we write it on a calendar, and we are monitoring how many eggs we get. That way, whenever we see that for a while we're not getting as many, we can kind of look and I can actually tell who lays what eggs by the color and size of the eggs. And then we'll be able to see like if that chicken is healthy. Now it is normal for chickens to take breaks periodically. We're actually not getting as many eggs right now because it's so hot outside. The girls are taking a little break. Ew, gonna have to wash that off. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the one that broke, we got seven eggs today so far. And that's pretty good for nine chickens. Pretty average for what we normally get. We get about seven a week, or seven a day. You probably think it's gross that my eggs are touching my fruit, but I'm gonna rinse it all anyway. And most of this fruit is gonna be cooked before we eat it, so it's whatever. The girls are following me because they see my basket full of fruit and vegetables. Ah, Mary, get back in there. Watch out, Yasha. Closing the gate. I spoil these chickens so much by giving them food all the time that whenever I'm holding anything, they expect that I have food in my hand. Can I set that right there. Now everything over here is doing pretty good, except my um, tomatillos. They try to wilt every single day. If I don't water these tomatillos, they just wilt. I think they might be root bound, so they just, that's a side effect of not having a big enough pot. Pretty big tomatillos. I have two plants in this five gallon bucket. My nasturtiums make me so happy. We have a beautiful range of colors right here. I have some like blood orange, some tangerine, and salmon colored. My little watermelon's getting a little bigger every day. Definitely looks like he's gonna be a crook neck. And my pumpkin's hanging in there. This is another one that wilts every day. I don't think I dug a big enough hole when I planted him and he wilts just about every single day. And once we water him, he perks right back up. So over here, I have planted in this pot. This is a spaghetti squash, and he has a little bit of damage, I think from roly polies. And then I actually had also planted a lemon cucumber, and I can see that seed right there, poop. Oh well, I'll need to plant another one. I had one that had already germinated and the roly polies completely ate it down to nothing. So I planted another one and it looks like I'm gonna have to plant it again. I also threw a lot of alyssum and oregano in this pot. And I see some coming up, but they're disappearing just as fast as they're coming up. So I think there's just a little bit too many roly polies in this pot. I don't know how they got in there, but it's full of roly polies and at night when they come out, they just eat on my plants. So we'll see if I can get anything growing in this pot. And then finally last, but certainly not least, this front garden bed in the dog yard. My 
Um, big, really big French breakfast radish has finally started to go to flower. It's bolted. And I can even see on here really, really small. They look like little beans. Some little radish beans. Isn't that cute? Little radish fruits. They look almost like little miniature like mustard fruits. I wonder if this is related to mustard. But I think those flowers are really pretty. Pretty white flowers. It's kind of crooked. And then we have my Market More Cucumber hanging in there. Did kind of bad this week. It got really, really hot. So he's kind of stopped growing, but I keep watering him. I think he'll do just fine. Then my cantaloupe is getting huge. He had a ton of flowers on him last week and now I'm not really seeing any flowers. So I think those were all male and they have since fallen off. My beans hate where they're at. They don't like the sunlight, but I think it's just too, too sunny and hot. So they are flowering. There's a ton of flowers on here all the time. However, um, they just fall right off. All the flowers, they fall right off. So I've even seen, like, I have saw this. these flowers were covered in bees. And then, so I know they're getting pollinated, but it's just too sunny of a location. So now I know, growing beans, I need to provide them with more shade, better protection from the sun, Maybe that will help me get some beans. We'll see if growing them in that back garden bed does anything for me. I have some yarrow, which are covered in ugly bean leaves. Yarrow's doing so good. No complaints there. Now I would, I say no complaints and then I say but. <laughs> I would love to see some flowers on these. Yarrow flowers are so pretty and I haven't seen them flower yet. I don't know when it's gonna happen, but hopefully, hopefully they will. Of course, my little sweet um, blue butterfly pea in the back is also doing really good. He's so small, I thought this plant was gonna grow faster and it's surprised me there. Catnip is so pretty. Look at how many flowers are on this catnip. They look white, but to me, it's almost like a little pastel pink. They're really, really pretty. And then my blue Sirius Sage. It's also doing really good. That's the garden. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really enjoyed having this garden tour with all of you guys. I think next week is going to be another huge week of harvest for us on our little homestead. So don't forget next week, the week 14 garden tour. I cannot believe this garden is doing as well as it is. So we will see. Odette's walking right under me, hoping that I step on pecans. You're crazy, Odette. And then she's checking, like anytime we walk next to a pecan, she's checking, oh, I must have stepped on it. Like they're all gonna take little bits of pecan with them. That's what my chickens do. They just follow me around for what food they can get out of me. If y'all liked this video, please hit the like button. Go ahead and subscribe. Tell your friends. Get the word out. Region Reverie, Garden Tours, woo. Um, I'm going to come up with a video here pretty soon about how to go ahead and start your homestead while you're still renting. I know we have big dreams to have acreage. I'm trying not to step on my chickens. They're all under me. Um, we have big dreams to start our homestead on our own land, our own acreage. We want to have some dairy goats. We want to get into making our own meat animals, growing those so that we can be as self-sustainable and self-sufficient as possible, especially in times like these. <laughs> My chickens are crazy right now. They're following me around. Well, I'm going to go ahead and give them some real treats, not just the pecans I step on. And until next time, keep doing what you're doing. Be passionate and thank you guys so much for watching. It really means a lot to see all the comments and the views and just thank you. Y'all have a good night. Guys, I'm not stepping on any pecans. Those guys are bossy telling me what to do here. My bossy chickens. Here, let me get y'all a treat. Come on.
All right, girls, you're only getting scratched today because it's going to rain tonight. That's the only reason. Look how beautiful that is. That is some good scratch. Oh, my goodness. I have, like, two of you stepping on my foot right now. You guys, I'll get you some. I really spoil these chickens. Come on, Mary. Let's get out of the bucket. There you go. One more handful. And I don't see Molly, so that means that she went back into the coop. Molly, there's no eggs in there. You're crazy.